Good evening, everyone. I'm Tom Lamog, a volunteer instructor with the Guitars for Vets Learning Center and with Challenge America Veteran Arts Community. Welcome to Song Sung True, A Veteran's View. Tonight, we're broadcasting our sixth episode, so thanks again for setting aside some time uh, and spending your evening with us. And before we begin our conversation with U.S. Army veteran and singer-songwriter Malachi Gaskin, I'd like to quickly share our motivation behind the show and how it supports the G4V mission. It's about helping veterans cope with PTSD through music. Through teamwork and camaraderie with Guitars for Vets, veterans join a community where they learn to play guitar and find solace in songs they love as well as the songs they have yet to write. Many are finding hope behind the wood and strings of an acoustic guitar, which we call the healing power of music. And the veteran singer-songwriters we invite to our podcast to bring their personal stories uh, and sing their original songs, these individuals are proof of this healing power. We are honored to have them share their musical journey with us. So thanks again for joining. Let's get started. Years a week, but I don't give a damn. There are answers that I see that make me who I am. Every day the sun comes up to find me driving on. The battle did not end for me because I made it home. There are times my feet are tired. And I must find my knees And I call for resupply Father, help me please There are 22 a day That you not to survive But I know inside of me Something's still alive In the garden Where I lose myself Planting seeds of hope Malachi Gaskin, a warrior's garden. Oh my goodness! Where are you, Malachi? Let me let me go ahead and bring you up on screen here. What a song! What a video! <laughs> Thank you. My God, there's a lot to unpack there. But before we get you started, it's great to see you. It's been, it's been wonderful it's talking you. with you uh, over the last few weeks, and uh, you've had some really incredible stories this year. And I'm so looking forward to you sharing this with our community out there. But before we do. Let's go ahead and get you properly introduced. Malachi spent 28 months in Iraq with the 3rd Infantry Division, 15 months as a combat medic, 
and also deployed using his secondary MOS as an infantryman. After a total of 17 years, Gaskin was medically retired for PTSD, MTBI, arthritis, bursitis, tinnitus, and hearing loss. And after two years of dedicated therapy and taking all medications prescribed to him, he determined that there had to be a better way. Tired of feeling drugged all the time, he and his wife took matters into their own hands and started an organic garden in their backyard, which went which he went on to write about in his 2016 book, A Warrior's Garden, A Therapeutic Guide to Living with Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder. Today, Gaskin helps others with healing and getting better based on the three pillars which have helped him, music, faith, and gardening. Malachias is also a guitarist for Vets graduate from our Nashville chapter where he received his Taylor guitar in October 2023 at the 21 Guitar Salute Ceremony. Now, I have to tell you, Malachi, first of all, uh, the song, the video that we, that we just uh, watched, it's not just a title. There is so much more to unpack. There is so much more. I have uh, had the opportunity to go online to look at some of the things that you've shared in the way of postings on social media, uh, your website and such. And as it turns out, Singer-songwriter is really just scratching the surface um, of who you are. Can you maybe tell us how we should be looking at you? I mean, singer-songwriter, combat um, veteran, yes, but there's more to this. What other things can you share? So I'm a holistic practitioner of PTSD and traumatic brain injury recovery. Um, I'm a father, a husband, um, an ordained minister. Um, 17 year army veteran you know i uh I, I mentor you know i do a lot like i mentor kids in my neighborhood in my in my in my community that that struggle with like they don't have a father at home they got in trouble with the courts and because of our garden program that we use for veterans here the courts have like, hey would you be willing to work with some of our kids so i do that as well um there's really i mean I, so kind of the way my ptsd manifests for like the way i self-treat is like i have to stay really busy which most of us are like yeah. that anyway, yeah. but sounds like I it. have to stay really, really busy. Well, that sounds like it. Well, I'll tell you what, we're going to take the next hour, an hour and 15 minutes, and um, we're going to go ahead and uh, talk through some of your life, whatever you're willing to share with us. But first, I want to go back to a Warriors Garden, the video. Okay. And it's just, like I said, a lot that's happening there. First of all, um, there are different components to putting a video together like that. First of all, you need a song. Yeah. And in order to do that, there's the songwriting process. Can you talk about, you know, from the very inception of the lyrics, what, um, what was it getting, what did you have to get together? What did you have to bring together to make that song come alive? Well, it was crazy because, you know, I, I retired from the Army in 2014. And then in 2016, 2017, 2016, um, I reached out to a friend because I had kind of given up on music and I reached out to a, a guy that I had met here in my local community. His name is JT Cooper. Uh, he was in 10th Mountain Division in Somalia during that whole Black Hawk Down, you know, all that stuff. And he was with the, the QRF team that went in to get the Rangers out. Uh, there's a documentary about his unit called the Lost Platoon. Um, they got they actually got separated from the unit and when they were he's a purple heart recipient he's just phenomenal he's just like everything about the man is just he's amazing a big in the um, songwriting and, community as well yeah, yeah. and oh, huge yeah. In, in the veteran and the non-veteran songwriting community like he's mm -hmm. he, everybody really literally everyone knows who he is here um and so i reached out to him and i was like hey dude like i'm i'm kind of getting the itch i want to get back into, into singing and writing and doing all this stuff and i said but i don't know how to take this story and put it into a song and he literally he's that guy he's like okay i'll see you on saturday morning so i just i went out to his office on saturday morning we sat down you know he goes what do you want to do and i was like i want to take my book i want to take the whole concept of the whole thing i want to put it into a song and he was like well tell me about it what's the concept and so i did an hour later he's like all right we're good and <laughs> like literally just it, it just flowed it came it just came together like and there's times where songs just write themselves and then there's times where songs take a lot of effort and a lot of work and trying to you know organize and put them where you want them and all that this song just really was one of those ones where it just it came together um and then a couple weeks later he called me and he was like hey look, we're gonna go to the studio and record are you ready and i was like yeah because he had sent me a little like a uh, phone recording and i've been kind of working on it and so we mm -hmm. went to the studio we recorded it and 
next thing you know, I was like, oh, I'm, least, I'm releasing a single. Let's do this. <laughs> now, is this the first song you've written? Or no, I've written? been I've been making music off and on since like '92. Um, I, I write, the day I dropped out of high school, I called a buddy up and I was like, I want to start a band. Wow. And he was like, what? I'm like, yeah, let's do it. And he's like, you know, this is 92. I'm 18 years old. He's like, what do you want to do? I'm like, let's do a punk band. And so we were, we, we became a punk rock band. So music has been with you for a while then. Oh, it, yeah. um, and it, what was it like trying to pull together other musicians not knowing that you <sighs> had this vision? So, okay. So all throughout my music, like 30 years doing music, I've, I've never been able to play an instrument and I've always just been a vocalist. I've wrote lyrics. I play, I sing. Um, and I, it's been very frustrating for throughout the years to find someone who wants to write the same thing I want to do, right? Uh, find someone who's willing to play the music I want to play, write the music I want to do, just on the same missions, right? So um, it's been very, so I've always struggled with, I wanted to learn to play guitar, I wanted to learn, but I, I just, there was something blocking me or keeping me from doing it. Um, all of a sudden, December of 2023, I just looked up, I looked my, I basically looked myself in the mirror. Like I'm going to learn to play guitar. I can't do this anymore. I'm tired of waiting on mm. other people. And so I went, grabbed, we I already had a couple of guitars in the house. So I went and grabbed a guitar, sat down, got on YouTube and just tried to figure it out. Buddy of mine sent me some, a couple, uh, a couple, uh, little 90 second. This is how I, this is my concept on strumming mm -hmm. type of videos mm -hmm. that he wrote. And next thing you know, I was like, I took off. And so <laughs> I think it was about, Two weeks in, I was playing one of my original songs and I was playing uh, a cover song. And at that point, I was just like, okay. So I submitted for the Guitars for Vets program in Nashville. There um, it is. Yeah. And the program here, it's like, it's great, but it, getting into it is kind of, there's a little bit of a struggle of getting into the program of finding the right path because everybody everybody has a different, like, no, you got to do it this way. No, you got to do this way. Like, once you get your stuff into the hands of the coordinator, it's seamless right but going through the va to get there it takes a little bit of like knowing the right person the right organization the right group that you have to talk to at the va hospital to get it started yeah. there's um yeah there's a, a lot of truth to that and i'm certain that our community can relate to to much of what you're saying with uh with the path that you've taken but let me ask you let's go back let's go back to your youth a little bit this you know a punk band what yeah. Captain what, Ahab's Spondalax. What, 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 how would your friends describe you? I mean, at this point in time, it's like, I want to pull together a band. But what, I mean, what are some of the uh, the thoughts that you remember of friends describing you? Are, were you outgoing? Were you pretty much oh. driven? Were you kind of like reserved? What, what, what was up it? Until, up until 2008 when I came home from Iraq the first time, like I was, I was always kind of tall. I was, I was always called like the social butterfly. Mm, okay. I, I would talk to the wall. Like my nickname as a kid from my parents was motor mouth. Cause I wouldn't shut up. Um, and, and just, I just talked to everyone about anything all the time. Um, like I was just, I was just a social guy. Like I, everywhere I went, I'd made friends. I, I didn't, I didn't know a stranger. You know what I mean? I came home from Iraq the first time after combat and it's like, yeah, I don't want to do that anymore. You know, so it takes it takes a lot of effort for me, like in public to kind of talk to people and kind of open up to people. I force myself to do it because I don't want to be that guy that's like, I don't want to be closed off. I want to I want to get back into that. And it gets easier the more you do it. But it's like it just took a lot to really get back into it. But yeah, as a kid growing up, like everybody, I talked to anyone. I didn't care. Are you thinking that, um, you know, when you had gone in uh, to the idea of doing a band, um, were you thinking that these I like people who are just like me or, or were you looking for diversity? I mean, there are um, some musicians who basically say, no, I kind of like the, uh, the imbalance of someone who's like totally not like me. And how did you approach that? Well, I think it depends on which way you're looking at it. So musically, I want people that we're all on the same page of what we want to do musically. Like we can all come from different musical backgrounds, right? But like musically, I want us to all have the same focus and the same mission. When it comes to like our personal backgrounds, that part doesn't bother me. I don't, if we're different, we're different. If we're the same, we're the same. I don't care. Like, cause I, it's, it's about the music at that point, you mm -hmm. know, to me, you know, to me, um, mm -hmm. I think that diversity, like if you have a diverse musical group, like if I have a female drummer or, you know, uh, you know, some, something different or whatever, in whatever position, I mean, can it add to it and, and enhance it? Heck yeah, I can. You know what I mean? But it, I think it really depends again on what is your mission? What is your purpose? What is your intent? And what do you want to do with that music? And do you all have the same, like if we're all completely diverse and we all have the exact same intent for the music, let's do it. 
if we're all exactly the same and we all have the same intent for the music again let's do it you know okay. if i want to go in and be a southern rock artist and you come in and you want to be a hip-hop artist we're probably if we can't make a way to put it together like we're not going to do it any yeah. of those experiences in putting that band together stay with you today yeah i mean you know you got to work with people you have to learn people's different personalities you have to understand that some people don't receive things the same way like you can you and i can be told the same thing mm -hmm. from one person at the exact same time in the exact same room with the exact same tone of voice happening and receive it completely separate like and have a completely different understanding of what was said so yeah you, you learn yeah. a lot about like how to communicate how other people receive communication and things like that so so okay so let's uh let me ask you this now after uh putting the band together and mm -hmm. did you get did you get to get out there and play i mean were you able we to did um how it was, was that like for so much fun as a kid you know <laughs> playing in other people's garages other than ours mm -hmm. um playing you know local clubs and things like that like it was it was awesome um I, I really it became an infectious thing like i wanted more of it i wanted to play it more often um we did uh you know we did showcases we did we did competitions we did you know local local band stuff like just all over and just i, I loved it every minute of it and then that band i got married and that band kind of my wife was like my first wife at the time was just like yeah i don't well, i don't like you being out there doing this so i kind of quit and then you know later on throughout the years i would you know dip, dabble back into it dabble back into it um mm -hmm. oh, yeah. funny how music does that now you said that you really didn't pick up guitar until 25 years later is uh that, so is 30 yeah 30, 30 years, years? like i i tried so many times i took lessons i paid for lessons i like i had buddies try to teach mm -hmm. me stuff like and i knew like an a minor chord a g chord a c chord a d chord like i knew the chords i couldn't do anything with any of them i just didn't none of it made sense to me i couldn't mm -hmm. when i would strum it i couldn't figure i couldn't find sounds that sounded good together you know what i mean like it just it was horrible um and again i was just i and i kept i kept saying to myself like i was speaking the negative to myself is like i can't do this i just can't do it it's just not going to happen. I'm not meant to play guitar. I'm just going to have to hire a guitar player. And, you know, when I came yeah. to Nashville, when I retired from the Army and I came here, like, there's, you know, musicians aplenty, you know, and eventually I ended up just hiring a guy to write my album with me. So, but I got to a point where it's like, again, I'm tired of, I'm tired of waiting for someone else to do something. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I just got to, I guess I just got to a point where I didn't want to not be able to do it anymore, more than I thought I couldn't. So to be clear, you were the singer. Yeah. you didn't play guitar obviously you were singing and you yep. were doing lyric writing and songwriting well, whoa. <laughs> so you're standing up there kind of a la lead singer you know yeah, being uh, the front know, man jumping around the front crazy. man that that was your that was your uh introduction to music being the front yep. man of a punk band is that right yeah and i've, and I've cool. done punk i've done country <laughs> i've done hard rock i've done blues like i mean all of it I have to tell you, I picked, you know, I, I I was taking a look at some of the music that you have written. I'm curious what some of your uh, influences, you know, maybe you can tell me vocally, uh, vocalist, I should say, is there a uh, particular person that you look up um, to as a vocalist? Buddy Holly, Elvis Presley, oh, um, no. Fats Domino, like phenomenal vocalists fat Domino, i think is one of the most underrated vocalists mm -hmm. of this generation like he, he was a piano player and he was a showman but he, that dude could sing really is that who you sing. tried to emulate when you were out there trying to uh when you were performing no so i'm i am completely weird and i don't i don't know like i've always just wanted to be me i would practice other vocalists and try to sound like them when i was singing their stuff but when it came to like my music i always did the best i could to just be me um and I get a lot of comparisons these days to like, you know, Lane Staley, Scott Stapp, um, Sully from Godsmack. Like I get a lot of that stuff. Um, but I just, I've never really tried to emulate anybody else. I've always tried to be just or organic in myself when it came to vocals. Um, now again, rehearsing wise, like I would try to, I would try to mimic people and find technique within that. You know, like listen to the way that Prince sang and, and how did he go from this register to that? Because that dude would go an eight octave jump or a six octave jump. And it's insane from note to note. And it was just crazy. Wow. Um, so like doing that and finding the tech, like trying to find that hidden techniques that they're using. Um, and then working with vocal coaches where they would they would work with you on. They, you know, I, but again, I just always was trying to be myself with it. Mm. So how do we how was the connection made um, from your adolescence and then into the military, what was uh, what was the inspiration that that 
pointed you towards um, enlisting? I so it's so weird that there was two things in my life I always knew I wanted to do. I wanted to be a soldier, and I wanted to make music. Um, after I retired from the army and I came home and I got to Tennessee, my mo- my mom came down to stay with us. And when she came down, she brought a big box of stuff from my childhood, and I started going through it. And there's just tons of photos or pictures that I had drawn with crayons or whatever in kindergarten and and in preschool where it was literally just like, I want to be a soldier, da 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 And it was just me and, you, you know, me drawing little people in camouflage or whatever. Um, so I kind of always just knew. My dad My dad served. Um, my grandfather was a retired command sergeant major. His father was a retired major. Like, I mean, every mm-hmm. male, from, from the way it was explained to me by my grandfather, um, every male in our family line, our direct family line, all served in the military. Whether it was Army or Marine Corps, we all served. I just I didn't this, want to not be that guy. You know what I mean? So, were you um, kind of encouraged? Did did your family encourage you to to join? No, my so my dad really never talked about his service. He he, he didn't have the most illustrious career. Um, mm-hmm. He made quite a few mistakes and it did not get out a very happy way. Um, and so he really he really talked very little about his military career. So when I decided to do it. Um, you know, he walked me to the recruiter's offices and he, he would go in with me and listen to everything. Um, and, but he just really never discussed it. And so when I did it, he was like, are you serious? And I was like, yeah. So I, you know, cause when I first joined, I joined the, the national guard. Um, and I served for nine years and then I got out for, I took a three year break and tried to be a rock star. I tried to just go on tour and do things. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I ended up all back on active duty in 2006. So, but he, he really, I was never really, it wasn't, it was never discouraged, but it was never really encouraged either. The, um, in our original conversation from a few weeks back, you were talking about the journey that you had to take just to enlist, um, you know, uh, coming out of, uh, the educational system. And, uh, can, can you share a little bit of how that journey went? Cause it wasn't, it wasn't an easy one. Yeah. I, I, uh, I dropped out of high school. And I went straight to work for my my dad owned a landscape company and a Mexican restaurant and a cleaning service. And I would I literally dropped out of high school, and I went to a payphone at a Hardee's restaurant across the road, and I was like, "Hey, I'm I'm gonna drop out." It's the last day of school, my junior year. We were about to take finals, and he's like, "Well, what are you gonna do?" I said, like, "I'm just gonna go to work." He's like, "All right." So I did. And then a year later, a uh, buddy of mine started talking to me about the military, and I was like, "You know what? I'm gonna do it." And I went to go see a Marine Corps recruiter. Well. I went to the active duty army recruiter first and he laughed at me. And then I went to, you know, the, uh, the air force recruiter and they laughed at me. And then, you know, cause they're like no GED, no nothing. Nope. Um, you know, and I, all the way down the line, I get to the Marine Corps. My uncle was a Marine Corps veteran who was like, he was very instrumental in my life. Um, very influential to me. And then, and he was a Vietnam veteran, retired first sergeant. Like he was, he was just, he's like one of the, the greatest men I've ever known. But anyway, I go to the Marine Corps recruiter and he's like, honestly, dude, go see the, go see the national guard. If you don't have a GED and you have nothing, like just go to the National Guard. Like that's where you want to start. He goes, you're gonna have a really hard time getting in without it. All right, cool. And so I went to the National Guard recruiter, and uh, he's like, "Do you got your GED yet?" And I was like, "Nope." He's like, "If I pay for it, will you enlist?" <laughs> I was like, "That's why I'm here." But if you're willing to pay for it, yes. So we jumped in his car, drove to the the thing, signed up for it. He paid the fee, went back to his office. Two weeks later, I went and took the test. About a month later, I got my results. And then I brought him to him and said, there you go. Let's get this done. <laughs> and nice. so I enlisted yeah. Yeah, I enlisted as a, as a, back then it was a 91 Bravo combat medic. Man, man oh man. Yeah. Well, it's time for a song. I think a legacy is the, uh, uh-huh. it's on deck here. And um, maybe just a brief, intro, just a brief overview of what the song is and then fill us in on any details that yeah. you want to share about this song. So Legacy was the lead off track on my album. Uh, the album is called For Those That Remain. And the song is based on that journey of any young man or young woman that has a desire to join because of family tradition, right? Because we just knew that, you know, our parents served, their parents served, somebody in our family served that we really, really looked up to. And we wanted to fulfill that. We wanted to be a part of that. So for me, I really just had this, I want to have my footprint inside that legacy, right? I want to be a part of it. I don't want to not be the one. I don't want to be the one that causes the break in the chain. So, all right. Malachi Skaskin, everyone. Hey. 
playground Playing army guys with all of his friends Saw the time on his mind Already knows what he wants to be Wants to grow up and serve his country It's all the time on his mind His turn to hold the line This is buried in his bones He can't see it in his future He knew it so long ago Fate meets destiny Leaving footprints on his journey This is his legacy Running around with all the roadblocks Jumping through all their hoops It's almost time, still on his mind Summertime and he's turned 18 Recruiters coming over to meet his family It's almost time, still on his mind great tune legacy and let me um kind of take you back uh sure. to those days how how did you imagine military life before you joined and uh was it anything like what you thought um so the first stint that first stint was a little different because like it's national guard right so i'm home every night i'm like you know i'm only going to drill on the weekends you know after basic training i after basic training in ait it was really about um going to work and showing up to drill right and doing doing what i was supposed to but i i put a little effort into it um i really enjoyed it like I, after i got back from basic and ait i already was missing the day-to-day -day, you know regimen right so anytime i had i was a landscaper so anytime there was a rain day i was at the armory i was like hey what's available what can i do how can i do this what can i do there um to a point where i ended up a year and a half later i reclassed from medic to infantry i went back to fort benning went to ait again became an infantryman came home became a fire team leader a couple of weeks a couple of months later i was made a squad leader as a corporal and uh at that point it was really i was off to the races because I, I would show up like hey do you want to go to mountain warfare school hey do you want to go to air assault hey do you want to go do this do you want to go to say rock do you want to go to sglic do you want to go to sticc TITC? like all these schools like do you want what do you want to go to i was like i want to go to ranger school um so i went to pre-ranger at benning um, which is a requirement for national guard and reservists you have to go through this three-week pre-ranger like indoctrination into the course before you can go on to ranger school um graduated pre-ranger but couldn't secure a slot into ranger school um and as you know as a private business owner and as you know all that you know husband and all that like it was just there was no way i was coming back um but i did i went to anything they would offer me i took it pldc i went to bnoc i went to anoc like and i was going early like when I made E5, they sent me a week later. They were like, hey, we have a slot for BNOC for you. And so <laughs> for the army, it's like you're the school you need to make staffs are. And so, but it was just like, I just, I, I was almost like it was, like I was meant for it. Yeah. 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 It, just like you're in your youth and adolescence, you yeah. kept busy, you kept moving. Hey, you know, there's something that um, 
in your bio, it said that you were part of a band. You were actually a vocalist. And I think I, if I got the acronym right, was it an on the, on the job OTJ or am I, I was, is it? Oh, a, <laughs> is that I went active duty? Okay. Yep, yep, I was OJT. Uh, <laughs> All right. Tell us about so, that. I, when I was on active duty, I got to Iraq uh, as a medic, and we were at Bob Kalsu, and we're walking through the Bob, and I got to the DFAC to go eat, and walked inside and saw this big flyer for the 3rd Infantry Division rock band was coming, and I'm like, wait, what? We have a freaking rock band in the Army? I didn't, like, I had no clue, right? So at that point, I went to my, my <laughs> I went to my command team, and I'm just like, hey, I want to I wanna audition for the band. I want to be in the rock band. And they looked at me, and I was like, look, when I was out of the army for those three years, like that's all I did. Like I was trying to be a rock star. I was on, I was playing everywhere I could play every, I had a band, the whole deal. And they're like, Oh snap. Okay. And so they figured out they could get me an audition and they're like, we'll get you an audition. I like, I'll reenlist if you get me the audition, but the agreement in my reenlistment is that you have to let me go if I make it. And so that was in my reenlistment contract. So I reenlisted, <laughs> uh, and it yeah. took me almost most of the deployment to finally get up to Baghdad to actually do the audition at the army band mm. um, for the third infantry division. And when I got there, I, I, it was so funny. I did, uh, I did kryptonite by three doors down and then I did hard to handle by the black crows. I got halfway through hard, oh, literally first verse, first chorus, second verse, and the band stopped playing. And I mean the guitar, the bass, the drums, everyone stopped. I'm like, Whoa, snap. Okay. And I went, grabbed my rifle, grabbed my hat, getting ready to yeah. walk out. And he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, y'all just quit playing. I figured I suck, you know? And he's like, no, dude, we've heard enough. You're in. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh. Uh, how often do you get to hear that? Jeez. Yeah. Um, wow. So I got my little acceptance letter and, and went and turned it in. And then, you know, we came home from Iraq and I ended up transferring over to the Army band uh, yep. at Port Stewart. So how do you balance that? How do you balance your duties with, with uh, the band? That became my job. I became a full-time military musician. Wow. Um, I was an OJT guy, so they gave me jobs okay. within the unit. I was the retention NCO. I was the equal opportunity NCO. I was the uh, government purchase card holder. Uh, again, stayed busy, right? Um, and if I wasn't in a, I didn't play an instrument, so I was a vocalist, so I had a lot to do, like outside of the band parts of things. So it's, mm. but if I wasn't doing all those things, I would go in a vocal booth, lock the door, and just sing, just sing, 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 just all the time, like. These are the songs that are set list, so I would have mm -hmm. a, my headphones in and I'd just be practicing those songs. Anything, anything, did you play for other veterans or um, active duty? We, or? we did, we played for, for other troops. We played for <laughs> local groups. We would go to the VA hospital and perform. I ended up deploying to Iraq a second mm -hmm. time for 13 months as a vocalist with the army band. And we toured all of Northern Iraq making, you know, hard rock and country and, and R&B. <laughs> wow. Well, fantastic. Do you have any, um, what were the, what were your favorite songs to sing? Can you, can you, when I was with the shed? army band, um, yeah. probably hemorrhage by fuel, um, knocking on heaven's door. Um, just cause I, I love the simplicity of that song. It's so, it's so simple, but so beautiful. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I would say probably, uh, we would do fight for your right to party by the beastie boys and it was me and my bass player did the vocals on it and it was it was because he was like six two like 225 i'm five seven at the time i was 150 and I, I we would run across the stage jump up and chest bump in the song and i would always get knocked over because how, <laughs> how solid he was right um, but we did it every show it was hilarious it was really really great wow those well, are probably fantastic. my favorites though well wonderful i know um you've got some other songs to do um and the rest of this hour i just want to uh go back to our our uh community this evening and if you do have questions that you would like to ask malachias please put it in the chat and we will get to it um at the end of the program or unless paul is there anything um that you can see right now that's coming up as uh we gotta add we gotta ask now i think he's got to say the name of his punk band again i'm not sure everyone heard that <laughs> so if anybody is familiar with the city in Wisconsin called Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, we named our band Captain Ahab's Fond du Lacs. <laughs> <laughs> We're a bunch of eighteen-year-old kids, though. It was, it was awesome, and the board just lit up. Okay. And Steve, uh, Steve Vaughn is creating a little bit of controversy <laughs> over which uh, branch of service has the best musical bands, but he's voting Steve. for Navy. <laughs> 
Uh, well, the Navy's Steve is the being one. Steve. <laughs> the Navy's the I only did. one that I, I could care less about. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I did put your uh, YouTube channel link and a link to your book in the chat. So if people want to see the book or get to your YouTube channel, that's available. And we have a few questions that will wait, Tom. Okay, real good. Thanks, Paul. So, uh, Malachi, let me ask you this. Um, yes. You know, when you were working with these musicians in the band and you – you know, or doing all the things that you were, I'm thinking you were dreaming of, of doing. Did you manage to keep in touch with these musicians? Are they still uh, friends or are they still so around? Or the they player that I worked with for Captain Ahab um, is now, he became a drummer and then he became a mandolin player and he, mm -hmm. he's, he plays everything. Him and I are still very close. We, we talk regularly. Um, and then I was in a band called Severance uh, that was a heavy metal, hard rock kind of alternative band. Um, and that's the one that like we came really really close that we almost got signed by a record label by Capitol records mm -hmm. um and uh the drummer and i are still very very close his name is al he's like probably one of the most he can play guitar bass drums piano like he does it all um but he was like awesome. he's he's a sick drummer. like and on the, on the album um for those that remain if you go to the song falling down that was a song that i originally did with um <laughs> nothing's wrong with the navy everything <laughs> nothing um but uh he uh he was so that song we wrote with uh i wrote with my band severance and he was mm. the drummer on that like his cymbal work is just like some of the greatest ever um and then some of the army yeah. musicians that i worked with like my my uh one of my fellow vocalists uh jason McElveen, like that dude like i don't know how he didn't make it as a professional musician like he's amazing uh, he's a drummer and he's a singer and he and he can play any style like it doesn't matter um mm, my so one awesome. of my guitar players that i worked with who was he was actually a, a army euphonium player but he ended up uh he also plays guitar him and i have actually written some songs together some of the songs that he and i wrote the lyrics are in the book uh a warrior's garden uh, awesome now here's the, have you recorded anything that's out there of of you and your uh you know your your bandmates to me it's kind um, of like it's just like you have everything else that's going on i think you've got gigs you've got band members you've got people who are appreciating what you do did you record any of that stuff so i've got there's a video of me <laughs> in iraq performing mm -hmm. at a christmas concert where i did i won't be home from christmas by blink 182 mm-hmm and okay. uh a christmas song and i can't remember the name of the life of me but it's a uh, bruce springsteen <laughs> christmas song um and Sa okay it's not santa claus is coming to town right yes yes oh it yes. is oh, okay okay <laughs> that's um, what i remember of him but it's on demons cool. and it's on youtube i believe All it's right. on my facebook uh on uh which one is and then we did some music videos for i did uh there's a lone star song that we covered um and then there was a bon jovi song that we covered and oh, then nice you know to the every musician has that one song that you're like i can't believe i ever did this um, <laughs> and we did the song 500 miles by um that was in the movie benny and june so cool wow yeah. so yeah you were yeah you were uh hitting them all, all yeah the, all the great tunes here so but two of the songs that are on my they're on my spotify one is called grind and one is called freedom i wrote with my army buddies and we released oh, them nice we released them this last year Awesome. Well, hey, it's time for another song. And uh, Wallet Size is what's on deck here. And wallet can size? you, um, yeah, share, us, share with us a little bit about how that song was crafted and the meaning of it. I stole it. 100% stole this song um, right, good to from know. my wife. So she wrote these lyrics back in the early 90s before we got together, um, early to mid 90s. And when we got married in 2002, um, I was sitting at home on a rain day because I was a landscaper and I was just kind of like going through this box of poems and artwork and just like mm -hmm. a shoe box or whatever it was. Um, and I found these lyrics called for the first line was when I see that picture without a frame and I started reading it and I got addicted and six packs like shaking his head. He, he loves this song. Um, and so, uh, I, I kind of was like, I took it and I was like, Hey, can I have these lyrics? And she was like, no, why, what do you want? <laughs> And, uh, and so it begins. And, yeah, right? It's like any wife, you know what I mean? No, you can't have this. What do you want them for? Why? It's a price. Um, and so I was like, well, I want to try to put it in. I want to create a song. And so I got a hold of my buddy Jeff. Um, Jeff is, if you haven't heard of the band uh, called American Bombshell, mm. like it's a heavy metal rockabilly. It's amazing. Like, And he's the vocalist for them. Um, but I got a hold of him and I was like, hey, dude, I can't play guitar. 
I need some help. And he was just like, oh, dude, hold on. Come on over. So, and I've known Jeff since third grade. Like, we've been friends forever. Mm, that's awesome. Uh, yeah. We still talk all the time. And so I go over to his house. We literally rehearsed twice. And then we went to the studio and recorded it. Um, right. And in, it, it's a, you know, 90s alternative hard rock and uh, kind of ballad <laughs> In and your then, wheelhouse. Uh, yeah, it's right in my wheelhouse. And then, yeah. uh, I, I, you know, a couple years ago when I did the album in 2022, um, we redid the song with my uh, my buddy Rory, who I was in the army band with. He was an army guitar player, and he is probably one of the top two, three guitarists I've ever worked with in my entire life. But nice. he restructured mm -hmm. it. Like, well, let me back up. I sat down with Paul Coleman, who's a former member of the Christian band called the Newsboys, um, and he restructured the song for me, like the tempo and the melody. Mm -hmm. And then I took it to Rory, and Rory re-recorded the guitar parts, and we sent it over to my producer, and redid the song and it's completely different like so we i have two versions of the song on my spotify one is the 2002 throwback which is that darker deeper lower tone slower and this this is the version that we settled on for the guitar or for the album um but in true 90s alternative fashion the name wall size is nowhere in the song so all right well malachi skasket everyone all right When I see that picture without a frame, I see what was there still remains. Scars in the wounds and the words that burn. Love is a love, then she turned. See that picture without a frame, I see the harbor, bitter pain. The eyes it once was so sincere to me, turn into a glare that went right for me. I don't want to hear me cry I couldn't stand to see you die Oh, my picture without a frame Every time I look, it takes me to those days What made you who stray? My picture without a frame you make it rain When I see that picture without a frame I see the heart will never be the same The eyes that once were so to see it in me Turn into a glare that went right to me But I don't want to hear me cry Couldn't stand to see you die. Oh, my picture without a frame. Every time I look, it takes me to those days. What made you who stray? My picture without a frame. When I see that picture without a frame the Ghost of you reveals your name the Words you whisper just weren't true When I guess you'll never know who's who I don't want to hear me cry I couldn't stand to see you die Oh, my picture without a frame me to those days that made you who stray my picture without a frame why'd you who make it rain I can still feel the rain all right Malachi Gaskin everyone and I've got to ask you this, you know, I mean, um, when it comes to uh, the transition from military life into the life of a civilian among civilians, a veteran among civilians, I want to say that right. Um, a veteran in the civilian community. In the community. There yeah. you go. 
Um, was there anything in particular that was effortless? And by the flip side of that coin, is there anything that you can think of that was especially challenging? Learning how to talk to non-veterans all over again because it's a completely different way that we discuss things and say things. Um, and one of my favorite stories I like to actually share because uh, of being the hard thing was I got hired right out of the army into this job where I was running this guy's company and he was doing millions of dollars a year in, in revenue, um, working with banks, just doing like credit card processing and then doing uh, identity theft monitoring. Um, and so I went into this and he hired me to, to run the whole thing for, I was his office manager in charge of every department, the whole deal. And so after I got in, I got trained, I got all the, all the stuff he wanted for me. Like we started doing our, our weekly meetings and we sat down and he goes, uh, he goes, Hey, so, um, we're going to do this new ad campaign and it's going to be like ABC, you know, all the things. And I'm like, okay, I'm like, nah, it's kind of stupid. We're not going to do that. I think we should do this. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And I said, mm-hmm. there's no like malice. It's like, ah, it's stupid. I don't want to do that. Let's do this. And he was like, actually, that's a good idea. I don't remember what the idea was anymore, but he was just like, that's actually a good idea. Let's let's do that. Go ahead. Go ahead and set that up. Send me an email, and then let's go ahead and get it going. I'm like, not a problem. Got this. I got you, you know? And the meeting ends, and he goes, hey, can you uh, can you stay back for a minute? I want to talk to you. I'm like, yeah, sure. So we get done, and all the department heads leave, and we close the door, and he goes, dude, you cannot call me stupid in front of everybody. I'm like, I didn't call you stupid. He goes, you said that's stupid. I'm like, it's, it's not good. Like, that's not a good idea. Like, you're not stupid. You own a company making millions of dollars. You're brilliant. This is not a good idea. It's a waste of time and money. And he looks at me, because, you know, in the military, I can be like, that's dumb. You're stupid mm-hmm. or that's stupid, right? No one no one takes offense to it. They're like, okay, why is it stupid? Because to us, we're just like, we're just short, we're blunt, we're quick, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and he, he was like, okay, I got to teach you how to talk to people because you if you talk to our customers like that, you're going to lose business for us. And so he taught me how to communicate. And that was the, probably the hardest thing for me to learn was how to communicate. Cause it's a completely different mindset when you're talking to people. Uh, Corporate because, speak, as we say. Yeah. Well, I mean, everybody in the military, well, in my experience, everybody I worked with in the military was very thick skinned. Like we did not take anything personal. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because our jobs, if you don't do your job, someone dies. Right. So it's like, if I'm getting corrected, it's so I don't cost lives. Um, so that was the hard thing. The, probably the easiest thing was the, because uh, every job that I've had since I got out, like I've, I've exceeded out, I've, I've been promoted, I've moved up quickly, faster than my peers, um, faster than people that have been there for long periods of time. Um, and so it was like that, that was easy just because of my work ethic, because of the military. Get up, go to work, do your job, don't complain, go home. You know, that was, that was probably the, the, the easiest thing for me. Um, and I have to it, it let you know that in looking at some of the posts that you have done, um, you're not leaving anyone behind. You're not leaving your brothers and sisters behind. You help them, help them position themselves to become successful, you know, in, in adapting to this world of, you know, of civilians, you know, being veterans and all. Um, staying close with them. I came across your um, a video with the Spartan Pledge, and uh, you know I have to tell you I was really moved by by that video. Can you can you share a little bit about that? Uh, who knows what the Spartan Pledge is? Anybody? Six pack. I know you do. Yeah. Okay. okay. So the Spartan right, Pledge good. is a suicide prevention modality that was created by veterans for veterans. Uh, it was written and created by uh, one of my best friends. His name is Boone Cutler. Um, he was a PSYOP NCO in Iraq. Um, he's just an amazing guy. He's very, very, very intelligent. Um, he wrote the Sodder, the manifesto of Sadr city, which was the, it, it was basically the plan to defeat Muqtada al Sadr uh, in Iraq. Um, and he, he's just brilliant. So anyway, he created the, he came home and, you know, with PTSD and traumatic brain injury and the struggle taking the medications and just constantly thinking about, you know, wanting to end his life and all that. And, we had tried to trying to find a way out of that, right? Not to think like that, to, to break the cycle. And so he sat down and wrote the Spartan Pledge. It's two sentences. The first one, I will not take my own life by my own hand until I talk to my battle buddy first. The second one, my mission is to find a mission and support my warfighter family. So what it is, is it's we as veterans, as warfighters, right? We are making a promise to each other that I will not end my life. I will reach out to you for help, right? I will give you the opportunity to talk me off the ledge before I make any drastic decisions, right? Because mm-hmm. sometimes that's all it takes. It's just, so I can't tell you, I've got a couple of friends of mine that I didn't know this until years later where they were like, I was done. I had decided to take my life and I 
picked up the phone and I called you and you answered and it's all it took. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's what it is, right? But because of our lives, because of our families, because of the things that we understand that life just gets crazy, right? Like I can tell you right now, I go to bed, my phone goes on silent and do not disturb. So if I'm sleeping, I'm sleeping. You're not going to wake me up. It's just not going to happen. I'm going to get my sleep, right? Leave me a voicemail. Hey man, Spartan pledge, call me back. Right. And then the second sentence, right? My mission is to find a mission and support my warfighter family. So get up off your duff while you're waiting for that call back, while you're waiting for that, that response, right? Get up off your duff, go find someone that needs help and help them. How can I bless you today? How can I help you today? Because a lot of times what happens is it's just that separation from connection, that separation from service, that as a veteran, that's what we're missing, right? That part of our identity of being a servant. Because as a soldier, as a, as a Marine, as a Navy, as an Airman, you know, as, as all the, we're servants. We're serving our nation. We're serving our military, right? And when we leave the military, we don't have that position where we serve anymore. We're not doing something. We're not a part of something bigger than ourselves anymore, right? We're not a part of, we're not a piece of that. And so if you can find a way to get back that feeling, those thoughts start to lower and decrease and go away. Not, and it may not be permanent, but yeah. it, they, it does, you know? And so I'm the, I'm the Tennessee state coordinator for the Spartan Pledge. So my job is to set up events around here. Every time I play a show, no matter where I'm at, I've done them in Illinois, I've done them in Kentucky, I've done them in Tennessee. Uh, I'm, a, I'm gonna do one, in, I've done one in Indiana. I'm gonna do another one in Indiana this year. Um, anytime I go and my band plays, we stop in the middle of our set and I do a Spartan Pledge. I offer it to any veteran, any first responder in the audience. Um, and that feeling like when you do it with, with a group of, of men and women where they're all there together and everybody's holding hands, hands on shoulders or something, right? Like the energy that comes off of that is unbelievable. And then that new lease on life, that new focus, that new energy just takes over, you mm -hmm. know? And, and cause a lot of them come there and they're there by themselves. They don't have anybody. And then you take the Spartan pledge and it's like, swap, and I tell them swap numbers. Everybody in this group needs to change phone numbers right now. If you don't have someone's number, get it. If you don't have someone's get mine before I leave. And I've, I've, I've given my number to you know hundreds of people easily just, but it's really about like stopping veterans from taking their lives. We have too much to offer our families. We have too much to offer our communities, regardless of how broken we may feel or may be, right? Regardless of our PTSD, our traumatic brain injury, our bodies being broken and like not being able to run and jump the way we used to or whatever, we still have a lot to offer our families and our communities and we need to be doing that. It's not gonna get better without us. It's gonna get worse without us. Thank you for that. Um, Thank you. There are two other things that I want to run by you before we uh, end the evening. One is uh, A Warrior's Garden, the book, and the experience that led up to that book. Okay. Now I want to ask you about your experience with guitar because, you know, you were saying earlier that, you know, I waited 30 years to learn to play guitar. And it wasn't yeah. until I picked it up, did a few things, even got into a guitar for vets. Would you... Would you share that experience with our community? Because again, many of them are still in the process of learning to play. Yeah, um, they're waiting for their lessons and their experience with, uh, you know, the uh, the upcoming uh, instructor that they're going to be assigned, hopefully, or maybe they're going through some of our learning modules like um, the Intro to Acoustic Guitar I tag. But uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about you know what it was like when you finally signed up and uh guitars for vets took you on your journey so yeah from when i signed up i was like i got i finally got approved i you know i went through the va program and i called my i started with i called my private my provider and i was like hey I, well let me back up just a little bit i actually got in contact with a good friend of mine who is a graduate of the program and that's really what kind of inspired me to do the program uh scotty hastings um, and I started, I started kind of just texting with Scotty and I was like, Hey dude, how, you did that program, right? And he was like, yeah, I'm like, is, is it worth it? Like, did it help? He's like, Oh dude, it made my playing better. And you know, this, that, and we, we got going on about it. And I'm like, how do I do it? You did the one in Nashville, right? And he's like, yeah, I'm like, how do I sign up for it? He's like, get a hold of, uh, he said, get a hold of recreational therapy and they will set you up. And so I did, I got a hold of my doctor. I got asked for a referral to recreational therapy. Recreational therapy goes, Oh no, you have to do it through music therapy. And I'm like, what the heck? And so they get me a hold of music, but, but this is like three months later, I finally get the, hey, you have to do this through music therapy. We're going to go ahead and transfer the referral over for you. Because normally they won't. You'll have to go back to your doctor and do it again because it's the VA and it's very bureaucratic, right? Um, and so I was like, okay, cool, no problem. And so 
I got a call from the guy that does it. He's in Murfreesboro. I'm, I'm in Columbia, so I'm an hour away. And I was like, hey, I really can't. I don't want to. I'm a veteran service officer at the time. I don't want to drive an hour because I'm taking away from my veterans. You know, he's like, well, we can do it over the phone. So we, we did a Zoom call and we talked for an hour and just explained how much music means to me and how much I love to play and, and sing and all that. And so he was like, yeah, I, I think it's a no brainer. I'm going to go ahead and get you a referral for the program. So as soon as he finalized my referral two months later, I got a I got a call I got a call right away from from uh, Patrick McGuire who's the Nashville coordinator and Patrick is just just one of the greatest dudes I've ever met. I say that a lot, but it's like I've met a lot of really great dudes lately. Um, and Patrick gave me a call. We talked. He's like, "All right, I'm gonna send you out an email with the dates and times for the very first meeting, all that stuff." And so I showed up and I got assigned to Dave McKenzie, which if you don't know who Dave McKenzie is as a guitar player and as a musician and as a performer, like you are missing out. <laughs> this dude has done it all. He has played with them all. He has toured with them all. Like he is unfreaking believable. And he forced it, I honestly like the lessons he gave me. It was like I was being force fed with a fire hose. Like it was just so much information coming at me at one time that he was just like pick up what you can, keep going with it, whatever. Dave and I still text, we still talk. Like he's just I love him so much. He is and his wife's still a professional musician. She still tours um from what I understand. Um but like he is just like he i mentioned that like my all-time favorite band of all time is heart and he, when i mentioned that in one of our lessons he was just like i was i opened for them on some of their first shows ever. <laughs> i'm like shut up dude like he's done it all like i absolutely adore him like he's phenomenal but you know he he did yeah. he, he taught me some better fingering techniques and he taught me some better strumming techniques he taught me how to palm mute which i wasn't i didn't know anything about um uh and he just he he exposed me to a lot of theory that i wasn't familiar with and, and i got assigned to dave because when i came in i was already able to play four or five songs on my own i was already mm -hmm. doing like open mic nights by myself with some of my originals um and so patrick gave me to dave to kind of get me more of that advanced kind of thing up front mm -hmm. um and and dave was just like well show me what you can already do and i played a couple of songs and then he's like okay and so he he helped i mean he refined a lot of what I'm doing. Like it still needs a lot of work. Cause I'm again, I don't consider myself a guitar player. I'm a, I'm a vocalist who is playing guitar to facilitate a need. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but Dave was just, it was unbelievable. And then the program was phenomenal. Like when I got done, like I have, I, we were, we were all gifted Epi Epiphones for graduation. Um, and I had everybody in my class, all the instructors, all the students, everybody signed my Epiphone. So it's up in my, that one's up in my bedroom. Sweet. Um, and it's got everybody's autograph. My whole family signed it, like everybody. And I'm not afraid to share <laughs> yeah. my journey on Facebook at all. I use Facebook kind of like a diary sometimes, but it's like it's really yeah. just meant to inspire other people to kind of try to do the same things I'm yeah. doing, which is get off it, their duff. And I and I, I'll, I caught a video that you promoted um, guitars for vets in a very positive way. And I thought after talking with Donald with Six Pack, it was kind of like I got to get in front of Malachias because he's, uh, you know, gone through the program and uh has some great things to say about it. thanks for sharing that can you maybe tell us what was maybe your biggest achievement going through the program for uh you know graduating with guitars for vets i would say the friend honestly to me it was the friendships that i made um with dave mckenzie with pat mcguire chuck thomas or thompson great people um all, all the instructors like uh you know they reached out to me afterwards and was like hey we're doing this 21 guitar salute thing at Copperline Ranch, which is Kenny Rogers, it, it's yeah. his ranch, yeah. and they're like, we want you to be one of the artists to perform and be a part of the ceremony. Um, so I got to go out there and actually perform some of my originals and, and play a couple uh, play a couple covers with the whole group of us. Oh um, yeah, yeah. Hey, I was, was a, there. Was I was there for that. Yeah, we, you, and we you? did not meet each other. It was crazy. We, yeah, Paul and I were there. I don't think we either of us met you there, but mm -hmm. um, I, we did catch you on stage. You were playing "Knocking on Heaven's Door" with everyone else, right? I was, which is like one of my all-time favorite. Thank you. So listen, um, I'm going to bring Paul on here in just a moment. But before okay. we do, and you can uh, kind of take a deep breath here, uh, let me just tell everyone about Guitars for Vets. Um, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Our cyber chapter allows veterans to enroll in the G4V program free of charge and complete private lessons online. These lessons are individualized and designed to help veterans learn guitar at their own pace. Upon completing our 11 lesson program, veterans receive a new acoustic guitar and the accessories needed to continue playing. Registration for Guitars for Vets Cyber Chapter opens on the first day of every month and remains open until full capacity 
has been reached. For more details and to also support our mission through donations, you can go to our website, www.guitarsforvets.org, and help us put music in the hands of our heroes. Hello, Paul. It's good to see you. I, Tom, I, you do that like such a natural. I know. It, it's amazing, you know, what being paid in Oreo cookies can do. It's to me, it's like I'm, I'm ready. Sponsored by yeah. Bacon. <laughs> Sponsored. <laughs> exactly. So you got uh, questions for Malachias, I hope, or if not, then so I, I know just, you've got your questions. So why don't you have at it, Paul? I've just unmuted everyone. So if you want, you can unmute and ask a question. Um, Malachias, I want to say there's like two things I really took from your story. So thanks again for spending this time with us. Um, when you talked about one of the hardest things coming back was communication with civilians. I really kind of was drawn to that because in my other career, I worked in the addictions, mental health treatment field. I was a social worker by training and I did training with law enforcement. And that's a really, uh, that's also a culture where they're experienced a trauma. It, it's obviously different than war trauma. They call it death by a thousand paper cups, uh, paper cuts, because yep. it's uh, many, many years of trauma that they might see versus kind of concentrated trauma. But I used to do resiliency training with them and, and just how they communicated, it was really interesting. They're very black and white. And part of that is their training. I mean, that's what helps them stay alive yep. and follow orders. But here we are as trained social workers where we're taught to see everything on a continuum and we're working with people and, you know, we're not not to be judgmental. So things are shades of gray. And it was just kind of a really interesting contrast because I got to be a lot, you know, I got to be close friends with a lot of the cops and we're able to get some distance from that and kind of joke about it now. But it's really one of the big things with law enforcement. And I'd imagine military when they come back in terms of their significant others and their marriages, just trying to figure that all out the communication style. So thanks for sharing that. Um, the other thing I was really just really drawn to is your three pillars. And I'm going to tell you something that's coming up. I don't want you to like commit or anything because we could talk offline. But uh, June is PTSD Awareness Month. It is. And Challenge America, which is the, the larger nonprofit that we're partnering with that um, Amy Grant and Vince Gill started, created this Cav Arts community for us. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to do work with them to do a larger um, event sometime in June around PTSD. And, and we're not framing it that way. We're framing it as kind of resiliency. As long and as I get to meet Amy Grant, I'm in. You know what? I said that about wanting to do the Guitars for Vets Learning Center. And I, I, I'm i sorry. You'd have to jump the line. I still haven't met her yet. <laughs> she it's, like funny an hour say, it's funny you didn't say Vince Gill because he's like the guitar god, you know? My first music concert ever was amy grant michael w smith and then a female that i don't remember who's I'm, I, I grew up on christian music um and uh but amy grant was the first and i was in love with her as a kid like i just was like she yeah was me, amazing. me too we had her yeah. uh we played one of her songs el shaddai at her wedding i was a big oh, yeah. amy grant very, that's early amy grant but anyways your three pillars yeah. is is a great framing for resiliency and i just really it love is. the idea of music and faith and what do you say gardening? And I know yeah. so many vets that use nature as a way to kind of heal or as, as part of a pillar for their res resiliency. So um, I, I would love. To, so I found a way to, I restructured it kind of where it's like, it's spiritual, creative, physical, because everybody's may be different, right? So for me, my three pillars specifically are faith, music, and gardening, right? Gotcha. Okay. Somebody else's may be like their spiritual may be different, their physical may be different, and their creative may be right, different, right? Right. So if once I so what I do a lot of times is I I'll sit veterans down, I'll sit their families down, or I will sit down like with my first responders or whatever, and we'll talk about like you know spiritually where do you connect, you know, you know creatively what do you like to do, like physically what gets you out of bed every day, you know what I mean? What's the one thing if I came in kicking? What's your, your door why? Said, yeah, exactly yeah, right. right. So once we can figure out what those are, I help them learn how to combine them into groups so they have like something to do every single day. But yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Like it's just a phenomenal, like I, I and I used to work with, uh, I still do, but I, I'll go to police, um, like their yearly seminars they have to take with for their training for their work, right. and I'll do intervention with veterans, like how to intervene with veterans, like body posture, like like the way that you stand, the way that you, where do you put your hands, like what do you de escalation? Do? Like, how how do you come in already de escalated, so that when the veteran sees doing, you, yeah. and they go, you know what I mean? So yeah, 
So anyways, in June, um, yeah. we haven't picked a date yet, but I would love to I'd love to talk to you offline about maybe you sure. being a part of that. I, I would love to somehow, if I can't get you there because there's a conflict or something, the whole idea of the Spartan Pledge is something I want to be a part of that. So okay. uh, I love that. Yeah, so thanks definitely. again. So questions. Um, first song you ever wrote and what was the name of it? <laughs> Magic Legs. And it was about <laughs> Lieutenant Dan from the movie Forrest Gump. Uh, <laughs> and the chorus was a uh, it was Wait. it was like the music would stop and the chorus would turn into a uh, high school football cheer lieutenant dan he's our man if he can't do it no one can magic legs and then we'd go into the rest of the song <laughs> it was punk so um do you read a lot like as part of your you know i know you wrote your book and mm -hmm. um we put the uh link in that but I wanna, wanted to ask if you, if there's any like books you recommend that you've read around dealing with trauma or healing? Um, or I So again, I'm, you know, I'm an ordained minister. Um, I do read a lot of like, you know, Christian-based books, um, but Facing Your Giants by Max Licato is a really, really good one. Um, I'm, a, I'm Right now, I'm really into the first two books by Jordan Peterson. Um, they're just, when you can get past the first couple chapters of the first book and you get through the whole, like the way that, you know, serotonin works on lobsters and all of that. And it gets into like, it, it, they're really, really beneficial for men, um, okay. especially men dealing with trauma. Um, if you can pull out the right nuggets, you know what I'm saying? And then right. um, wild at heart is a good one by John Eldridge. Uh, it really, that helped me deal with a lot of my childhood trauma um, and, and understanding what masculinity really is and how it's supposed to be portrayed and used. Um, and so, cause you know, you come back from combat and you have, you have all this trauma you don't know what to do with, and then it gets misplaced. It's like, I honestly think I'm going to go, I might, I'm trying to keep, try to keep me from going on a tangent here. Um, I, th I think that's where we have screwed up and we use the word like toxic, toxic masculinity because the traits that we interject into masculinity due to our trauma or our upbringing don't make masculinity toxic they make us toxic masculinity is what it is that's just that's my opinion um but that's where i think it, a lot of times where it gets exhibited through is through it looks and masks and seems similar to that but um yeah so so wild at heart is a good one um and i read a lot of fantasy stuff like i'm i, I, like, I like to disconnect you know what i mean so when i got out of when i got out of the army i ended up using my gi bill i went to college and I got, I was, you know, high school dropout, GED. I go to college. I get a master, I get a bachelor's in psychology. Um, I'm currently enrolled, but on pause, working on a master's in social work. Fantastic. So I read. Man. I I kept every one of my college psychology books from from undergraduate. I didn't I didn't get rid of any of my. I go back to them and reference them and try to study from them and learn from them. Abnormal psychology was my favorite, but that's a whole yeah. different story. Social and abnormal were my two favorites. So Ken just entered into the chat. Thanks for doing this. I'm in the same boat and I came to G4V to help me with songwriting. So this has been extremely inspirational. Awesome. Hopefully I'll be able to put these songs I have in my head out into the world after I gain the skills from this amazing program. We are here for you, Ken. We also got programs like the Guitar Players Toolkit. It's all about making music with your instrument. So yep. fantastic. Yeah, I've, I've been going through a lot of that stuff too. Um, it's, it's great. Everything that's online, there's so much there and there's so many things um, that's helped uh, push me forward. Um, I'm in a place now, I'm what, week two now in my classes awesome. and we're Callous already stage. putting that first song together. You're in the callus stage. Yeah. Well, I'm, I've, yeah, the calluses are here. They're, they're actually, the first ones are coming off and uh, the second ones are coming up. Um, You're shedding. All right. Those, those yeah. So. <laughs> Uh, it's a lot of work, but it's it's fun, um, and it's it's you know it, it's been extremely inspirational coming on and, and, and listening to you tell your story and you. and how you came to the program. It's similar to me. I you know I've written a lot of lyrics, and I had the music in my head. I had no way of putting it out and getting it out. And you know I'd go to people, hey, can you help me with this? Can you help me with that? And they're like, well, what chord progression are you wanting to use? And I, I have no idea. I just, you know, I'm, I'm right. hearing this in my head. I don't, I don't know anything about that. And so I was like, well, maybe I need to learn more. And so I started looking online and that's, that's how I found the program. And I'm so thankful I did. And so thankful for all of you, for all you do. Um, it's, it's, it's been a blessing. Ken, you, you know, are, Ken, 
you're in really good company because Paul McCartney would hear a melody in his head and he'd have to go figure out what chords fit the melody. So you're in really good company. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, that's 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 exactly what it is like. Um, you know, I can hear it and I'm writing it, you know, writing everything down and I've got it all in my head. And it's like, all right, so now I go go online and go to a, there's a chord progression app and I start hitting, you know, all the different ones until I find the one that, you know, matches close enough to what I got going on. Idea. Yeah. Hold on. Let me let me find it. Right. <laughs> so yeah. Frank, we were talking it. about uh, we were talking about you were uh, telling us about some books and uh, Frank said Tribe by Sebastian Younger is good as Sebastian well. Sebastian Younger is amazing. I got to meet him in Nashville a couple of years ago, uh, 26, 2015. Um, I got to see the, it was 2015 or 2016. I got to see the release of the Hornet's Nest, which was like kind of like the follow up to Restrepo. And he's just one of the most, He's been through what we've been through, but he did it without a weapon. You know what I mean? Like he sat there in the dirt with us in Afghanistan and Iraq and just was going through all of it. And so back, yeah, his books are amazing. They're great. Tom, that's all I got. Chord progression master. All right. On Android. Yeah. I'm going to put that on my note. Hold on. Yeah. Ken, I don't know. You've probably been told this, but if you do actually have a melody in your head and you can reproduce the notes you're hearing on your guitar. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. That first note is going to be uh, a name of a note, like it might be a G or a B or a C. Uh, and then just try throwing that first chord over that to see if that kind of matches with it. All right. I'll give that a try because uh, right now I'm, I'm just going through that chord progression app and I just hit all the different chord progressions until I hear one that right. matches because it, it'll play it out, you know, and it, it's got different. It's got different settings in there for the different types of flow and, and, and pitches and everything like that too. So you can get different sounds out of the out of the chord. So it's it's really good. Helps me out a whole lot. Okay, real good. Thanks, Paul. Um hey Malachias, I want to uh go, c circle back to your um to your book. Uh yeah. I know we're uh we put this at the tail end, um, but maybe you can kind of talk a little bit about the book and what was it that inspired you to get that um, together to publish it and to build really a lifestyle around you know what it is that you have uh, in your book yeah I uh, so I was going through a medical retirement process from the military um, the MEB and it was not going well it Early on, it started. It started off kind of bad. Cause I thought I was at first I was getting kicked out of the army because I didn't have an EMT license anymore. Um, and then I got accepted into a medical retirement board because I punched the glass door in front of our band building and it exploded. And they had to replace the glass. And then they, my commander, who was a really good guy, he had me get in his truck and drove me over to behavioral health. And they talked with me. And then the very next day, it was like, "Yeah, you're going into a med board." Um, and so I was, but I was at that point, I was already taking like a hundred milligrams of Seroquel every day, which is an antipsychotic. I was taking 40 milligrams of Celexa, 25 milligrams of Prozac. I was taking Ambien. I was taking like, I was just taking tons of tons of medications. Mm -hmm. Um, and I got to a point where my wife didn't like it. I didn't like it. I didn't like, I was putting on weight hand over fist and I just couldn't take it off. No matter what I did, I smelled like a walking bathroom, um, because of the medications. And so we decided at that point, like, you know, I went, to, well, I went to my very last therapy meeting and I was like, you know, I was like, I, I come in every week, I pour my heart out. I tell you everything that I can't tell my family. Cause I don't want them to, I don't want to see that look on their face when I tell them things I had to do in combat that I wasn't supposed to have to do, you know? And I was like, I come in every week and tell you all this and you don't say anything. All you do is type on your keyboard, see you next week. And I, my exact words were, what am I supposed to do? Help me. And she looked me square in the face for the first time in months and goes, I don't know, get a dog, start a garden. And I literally stood up, flipped my chair. I cussed her out. I went off. I lost my brain. Like I just went off the deep end, stormed out of the building, went home and told my wife that my therapist said, get a dog. And she's like, no, you're not getting a dog, which I have two, by the way. Um, so now I've got dogs. And But she was like, what else did your therapist say? And I'm like, no, no, no. She's like, what? Start a garden. And she was like, all right, get in the truck. So, you know, we get in the vehicle. We drive to Lowe's. We bought dirt, seed, lumber, everything, came back. Living on post in military housing, uh, went into my backyard eight o'clock at night. She's got two flashlights and I'm building a four foot by four foot raised bed garden in my backyard. 
Um, and so at that point, my I had met this guy, Robbie Grayson, who is my publisher and one of my absolute best friends. Um, but I met him through a mutual friend on Facebook and he was just like, Hey, I want to know more about your story. And so I told him and he was like, he's like, Hey, I want to bring a film crew from Nashville to Savannah and I want to film you and these, cause I was writing new music and he goes, I want to film you writing this music and going into the studio and all that. And so we put in a request to do this documentary through the military, through PAO, the whole, you know, everything the way we we're supposed to do it. Right. And he, a week out from the, them buying their plane tickets, getting on a plane and coming to see me to do it. We had, it was scripted. Everything was finished, right? They just needed to get on a plane and come film it. A week out, I get a phone call. I was at, I was at the the band hall and I get a phone call going, hey, Sergeant Gaskin, we need you to come up to building one, which is where the general works. And it's like, oh, I don't want to go to building one. So I run to building one mm-hmm. and this full bird colonel pulls me aside and goes, hey, dude, tell me about this. And he was like, exactly, he was like a hippie. He's like, dude, tell me about this documentary. And like, oh, we're writing this music about trauma, about PTSD and about being you know, a soldier and all that stuff like that. We wanna, they wanna film this thing about how I use it to kind of self treat for trauma and all. He's like, that's amazing. I wish we could let you do it. Oh. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> you know, <laughs> they did you it. Have started with that. They did it um, though, right? I thought no, I saw. So, oh no, oh, okay. I, I, ended up, I ended up leaving, um, oh, okay. and I went over to. I, I got I got out in the vehicle and I called Robbie and I was like, hey, we got to cancel the documentary. Do not let them buy their plane tickets. I'll call you tomorrow. Right. So I called oh. Robbie the next day and and told him what happened and he was just like, because I had to I had to digest it. I had to let it, you know, like I had to I had to get rid of the I want to shoot somebody mentality at that point, you know, because I was so mad. <laughs> um, and so I called Robbie the next day and told him what happened. He's like, dude, you should just write a book. And I was like, what? Mm. He's like, you should literally just write a book about all the different things you're doing, like all the stuff that you're doing for yourself. You should write it because if you write it, I'll publish it. And I was like, and I'm like, dude, I'm a high school dropout with a GED. Who in the hell is going to read that? You know, and he was just like, no, seriously, write the book. And so I was like, all right, fine, whatever. So I, I wrote a, <laughs> I wrote it out of spite to show him that it wouldn't do anything. And now it's been sold <laughs> in some countries. I've traveled to China yeah. to speak about suicide prevention. Like the Chinese government paid for me to come and speak about suicide prevention. Um, I've seen some of those presentations yeah. that you've done. There are a number of them too. Did, uh, did you anticipate it would get the attention that it did? I didn't think it was going to do anything. Honestly, I didn't. I just, but it's a, it's it opened up the doors where I get to speak in front of other veterans and talk about my story and kind of let them, yeah. let, you know, because a lot of times we just think we feel isolated because we isolate ourselves, right? And so then we feel isolated, and then we're like, oh my god, someone else has the same experience as me. That's crazy. Um, Thank you for sharing that. I, 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 we need to have you come back because there's more to that story, that book. Um, yeah. It it goes much deeper than this, but I don't want to forget about this last song that you've got planned for us um and uh i've got it written here somewhere (laughs) well let's see it's uh, no doubt of mine and uh i remember you sharing you know the background uh on that song with me and i found uh it to be quite moving and i um i have to tell you i this is a, a later release, right? This is something that's just recently come out, or released. getting ready to release. So yeah. this is, uh, so, yeah. So what, what, what would you like to share with us about that song? No doubt of mine. Well, I, I wrote this while I was actually in the G for B program. Um, week two, I had all my teeth pulled and had implants installed, um, and ended up with like I have all new shiny perfect teeth, mm. right? Um, but as I'm sitting home three days after surgery. Um, I, the song just jumped in my head. And so I had to go, I went in the other room. I had just gotten my interface in the mail. Um, so I got everything plugged in and I just, I start. I wrote the lyrics in like probably 15, 20 minutes. Um, and then I just sat down and started strumming, trying to find the pattern I wanted and all that stuff. You know, like I always write backwards. I come, I come up with the lyrics and I'm like, I don't know what I want it to sound like. I got to figure mm-hmm. out a melody. Um, and so I, I did that. I, I came up with it and I recorded it three days post surgery wearing uh, temporary dentures. <laughs> And so I recorded it and sent it to my buddy Josh, uh, who I wrote the song Grind and the song Freedom with. Um, and he was like, I want to be a part of this one. And I was like, okay, I, I need a track for it because that's all I've got. I can't play drums. I can't play any. And so he, so it sounds like I got a chief in it, you know what I mean? On the demo version. <laughs> um, mm. And uh, so Josh created the backing track with guitar, bass, drums, keys, all of it. And I'm going to the studio this coming Sunday on the 14th to put down the professional vocals, get them to him so he can master and mix it and finish it. 
um, and then we're gonna it's a Christian country song um, it is a true story it's the first song that I've written this way but I wrote it during the the program is that I found out at 13 years old that I was adopted by my mother my father was my father but my mom had adopted me and my dad was just like when I told him I wanted to learn to play guitar at 12 years old he looked at me and said no son mine's gonna be the F-A-G-G OT right and I was just like dad whoa dude this is the 80s we don't say that <laughs> like that's what we call dumb people we don't say that like that you know and he was just like you're not no no it's not happening and so I, at that point like nothing was ever good enough like I from 10 years old until he passed away I wasn't his son anymore I was an employee um, and I had a permanent bruise from 11 about that big I had a permanent bruise on my chest uh, until I was 19 years old where he would just poke me all the time and he always mm -hmm. hit the same spot every time all the things and so he was just not a he wasn't a good dude um and he was an alcoholic until I was about eight years old and then after he quit drinking he started it was became a work addiction like he traded one addiction for the other my birth mother I finally met her at the age of 18 and I have absolutely zero use for her as a person as a human as a life on this planet I have zero use for her I wish her the best in her life but I have she's not involved in anything anywhere I do because of who she is as a person. Um, and I tried, I gave her multiple, I, I gave her more chances than I've probably given anybody in my life in my entire history. Um, and then, so the, that's the first, the first two thirds of the song. The last part of the song is, is about basically who I hope to be as a, as a parent, because you know who they were and who I hope to be. So, and okay. it's called no doubt of mine. Right. And I wrote this one with a capo. All right. All right, Malachi. Because I was listening to, uh, what's that song by Aaron Lewis? Um, I don't remember now. But yeah, I, he used a capo. And so I was like, I'm going to use a capo. So All right, sir. All right. No, no doubt of mine. No doubt of mine. My father told me Never give up son Give it all you got Take your side and run Life won't be easy If you wanna be the one Keep your head down and keep on running For that finish line But that was just a dream that was no doubt of mine Nothing that I did was good enough And it wouldn't make the time I did the best that I could And it made it feel like a crime My mama told me I was a favorite son I could do no wrong Life was full of fun My Girls will be lining up And you'll be the one Keep your head down And keep on running For that finish line But that was just a dream That was no mama mine Nothing that I did was good enough and she wouldn't make the time I did the best that I could And she made it feel like a crime solo goes but I can't play solo I told my children never give up you only get one chance at life so give it all you got I'll be here if you fall to dust you off get a steady stance and take aim and give it your best shot 
And I dreamt that my kids would say I love that dad of mine Everything we did was good enough And he always made the time We did the best that we could And he made it feel alright The story is I'm not the perfect dad I did the best that I could To give them all I had Malachi Gaskin, everyone U.S. Army veteran, singer, songwriter And so much more What incredible stories Thank you so much for sharing them with us uh, And with the community and your and your songs as well too. Um, can you tell us where we can find your music? Um, you can find it on Facebook at Malachi's Music. Um, you can find it on Spotify, iTunes, iHeartRadio, like all the streaming apps. Uh, Malachi's M A L A C H I A S. Um, and you can buy it directly. You can buy the MP3s directly from my website, which is MalachiasMusic.com. Any projects in the uh, wings that we uh, should know about or anything that you want to share? Uh, so that song is coming out soon, like probably June-ish. Um, I I just did, so I can't really talk a whole lot about it, but I just did an audition for a um, heavy metal rock band out of Houston, Texas, that if I get it, will put me on tour. Um you're going like back to your wheelhouse your again. Yeah, right. So, I, and I would be a front man. I wouldn't be a guitar player for that project. So, I'm really excited about it. I'm really kind of hoping I get it. Um, if not, whoever gets it, like I just hope it's the right person for the job. Is all you know what I mean? Because the the band has a mission that they 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 do, and it's really important. Um, and then uh, I do have another song coming out later this year. That's a it's a Christian metal song called "Not My Father's Son." Um, and I, I mean, other than that, like I'm just. I'm plugging away, like, you know, booking writer's nights, um, trying to book shows, stuff like that. So, and, and everything I try to do, like most of my music, it's, it's all, you know, veteran focused, like that, that last song, Ken, thank you for that. By the way, I read what you said. Um, I honestly, that was my first stab since the military about writing a song that wasn't military focused. And that seems to be getting the biggest response from everybody. Um, in fact, my son who like idolized and worshiped my dad, like just loved him to pieces when he heard it. I was really concerned. Like, when he heard it, he w it would affect him in some way. But he was like, "Dad, that was amazing." Um, it's one of my favorite ones right now, like that I play. Um, but yeah, it's, this year's kind of. I'm just kind of taking it as it goes. I'm putting in a lot of a lot of effort, like taking time every night. I work nights now, so but I have every every couple of days I have a couple of days off, and so I go out in the garage when my family's sleeping and just kind of strum away, strum away, strum away, just keeping keeping my fingers moving. What you got to you know do? I mean? Keep the keep the creative juices flowing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thanks again for sharing your stories. Uh, and uh, Paul, is there anything you want to close with here before I send everyone on their merry way? I just got that melody in my head, which is where I want to keep it. So um, All right. just appreciate what you're doing for us thank and thank the rest of the community for giving up a whatever time it is in your time zone. We appreciate you hanging with us. Thank you. And one last thing uh, before I cut everyone loose, and that is um, our next episode of Song Sung True of Veterans View is uh, Thursday, April 25th, 7.30 p.m. Central. It is um, a show that's featuring U.S. Navy veteran Shannon Book, and uh, that's in My a couple dude. of weeks. Yeah, Fellow medic. Yeah. Fellow oh. medic. For guitars, for vets, and for the Challenge American Veteran Arts community, I'm Tom Labog. We will see you next time. Thank you and good night, everyone.